welcome family, friends, and patients. We look forward to a great discussion this evening. My uh, approach tonight, I hope, will lend a great deal of clarity, also hopefully some optimism to all of you as you deal with this uh, serious pandemic uh, that the world is facing. Uh, I hope to not only uh, help you view the entirety of the epidemiology and the world health issues, but also in a very personalized and precision way, help you navigate the process and be as hardy and as resilient as you can be during this pandemic, both for the health of your family, your staffs, as well as yourself in this process. Very interestingly, even at Harvard Medical School 11 days ago, the hypothesis connecting COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease became quite profound. Uh, the hypothesis is that COVID-19 begins as a respiratory virus, but it kills as a cardiovascular virus. So ruminate on that, if you will, as we move through this discussion and try to empower you to embrace all the things you can do to protect yourself and your family during these times. Certainly from a public health perspective, there's a lot uh, of data and information about uh, social and personal isolation. And we don't know a lot about the virus yet. We're learning eventually antibodies and vaccines will, will develop and, and will be more safe from a direct viral perspective. But as is our approach to all cardiovascular disease, which is the biggest cause of death in the world today, uh, prevention and readiness is very important. So we'll explore this COVID-19 cardiovascular connection tonight with you. And again, welcome to everybody uh, to this evening's uh, webinar. Very important as we move toward a discussion of COVID-19 as a trigger for cardiovascular risk, as the SARS-CoV-2 virus then becomes COVID-19 disease, that then may be an important trigger of cardiovascular disease and death. But even back in 2018, this article from the New England Journal of Medicine very elegantly showed that even influenza A and influenza B can be dangerous. And I think that doesn't lessen our worry over COVID-19, but it does highlight that the world is a dangerous place. There will be new infections, pandemics, and even the general world of stress and cholesterol and blood pressure and habits all tend to lead us to greater risk of heart disease. In this case, the, the researchers that published in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at documented influenza A and influenza B. Now, whenever I get sick, I usually don't go to the doctor and get an exact viral antibody test to determine if I had influenza A or influenza B. Usually I'll just say I had a cold or you know, go on about my business. But those who actually get documented disease were then compared uh, to their colleagues in this study. Now there are about 400 patients and they all had cardiovascular risk. They all had some of the things we'll talk about tonight that make you more or less resistant to this process. Now, the central seven days of infection were compared with the longer green bars on either side of that central seven days of a time period of 52 weeks before the influenza attack and 52 weeks after the influenza attack. And they were trying to see, did the triggering of the cardiovascular disease occur more prominently when influenza A and influenza B were prevalent? Now, this busy slide slow shows you how elegant the study was, but quite interestingly, in the upper right corner circled, you see that during that seven days, the risk of death for those over 75 or the risk of heart attack was 7.31 times normal, 7.31 times of what you would see on a week either side of that virus. So there was very much a problem in that regard. Now, at the bottom, you'll see uh, another circle under acute MI hospitalizations. And in this discussion, you'll see that if someone had already had a heart attack, their death rate was only three and a half times normal compared to those who hadn't yet had a heart attack, their death rate was almost seven times normal. The reason for this is the people that had already had a heart attack were on medications like statin medicines and ACEs and ARBs, blood pressure control, post-MI uh, care, clotting control mechanisms and medications, aspirin. Those, interestingly, seem to be protective of the people in this trial in 2018 who had had influenza A and influenza B. So what we can take away from this is that all viruses, all inflammatory and oxidative type illnesses can wreak havoc on the system, on the cardiovascular system. So while we need to be very uh, deferential to co 
uh, COVID-19. We need to realize that our, our future is best prepared by aggressively optimizing our cardiovascular health. Ultimately, that leads to the blood vessels that supply every organ. So from the kidneys to the liver, to the lungs, to the brain, optimizing cardiovascular health is very important. Now, as Harvard Medical School highlighted, this is a, a pulmonary virus, a lung virus, a respiratory virus, but it seems to wreak havoc and death through clotting, through cardiovascular and vascular uh, problems ruptured atherosclerotic plaque, arterial thrombosis. These are the kinds of things that are happening in the lungs and the hearts of those more severely ill with this COVID-19 disease. Here you see a, a, an autopsy slide of a blood vessel that was impacted by the reddish clot that developed around a blood vessel that had plaque on the bottom half of the screen, which had separated inside the wall of the blood vessel, leading to inflammation, plaque rupture. And these are the kinds of things that are happening in the blood vessels that are more prominently sick. Now, my work in preventive cardiology is not like our public health doctors. They must be a doctor for all of America with their strategies being more public health oriented. You also need to take a, a look at things from a precision, personalized perspective based on your own very precise data as what you should do to prevent something like this from happening. And oftentimes it can be as little as taking appropriate supplements and aspirin, statin drugs, and other things that might be helpful in securing the lining of the artery. Now the lining of the artery is called the endothelium. And the endothelium is where much of the damage will occur. And we'll talk a lot tonight about endothelial health and how you can then optimize that in your own lives. Now at the Boone Heart Institute, our life goal, our career goal, our clinic goal is the eradication of heart disease and stroke. So we've been at this a long time to try to, to weather the storm of, of aging and cardiovascular risk to make sure that we do not need the advanced interventional skills of hospitals and advanced physicians because we have prevented what might have become a catastrophe. And in that process, we often break things down so that we can understand the various risks that occur. We've centered a lot of our discussion around the analogy of the four horsemen of heart disease and stroke. These then can be can be traveled forward to even present to, in today's world of how do you prevent uh, damage and demise from the COVID-19 disease and illness. Uh, one, two, three, and four illustrate plaque, clot, muscle, valves, and electricity. The plaque probably being the most important, the damage of this tender lining of the arteries, the damage that plays itself out in heart disease and stroke. And this damage often leads to coronary cerebral atherosclerosis, but also likely in the pulmonary arteries, in the arteries that are trying to extract oxygen from their lungs and of the patient, often those arteries are clogged with what we've heard to be called the cytokine storm, the oxidative inflammation response to the virus. That appears to be the killer, not so much the virus itself, but what is engendered by uh, the infection. So coronary, cerebral, even pulmonary atherosclerosis and thrombosis can be very critical. And even in recent data, just in the last week, there's been some evidence that the muscle of the heart is stretched on the right side as the heart tries to pump blood into the clogged arteries that are throughout the lung. So how can we optimize that and then prevent the electricity uh, to stop signaling the heart to beat appropriately? So with that in mind, looking at your status personally in these four horsemen of cardiovascular disease has then been developed around the epidemiology of COVID-19. You've heard the word comorbidities, and ultimately that's a, a medical term for multiple associated diseases and syndromes. And amazingly, up to nine out of 10, 89.3% of people hospitalized have five of these comorbidities led by hypertension, obesity, chronic lung disease, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. These are very critically the associated phenomena. So while I can't cure COVID-19 virus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus, I can make your body more prepared to accept that virus and to survive it with little damage as possible. Now that takes a personalized preventive strategy often around this process. So these comorbidities are one to be looked at very aggressively. And as we see more elaborate tables, you see the red bars illustrating the older among us. Uh, the older I get, 65 seems pretty young. The 
Red bar illustrates the damage that hypertension, obesity, chronic lung disease, diabetes, and especially on the right, cardiovascular disease plays in those hospitalized. Now, my goal with you tonight is make sure that none of us get very sick and need hospitalization or intensive care units or other approaches. You can see that our younger age groups, it looks like obesity is a key uh, for the younger people. But even those who are younger and die with what we suspect is very little risk might have hidden risks that we'll talk about as we look at why people have this risk, the detection of the disease, why is it present, what are the vulnerabilities, and then how do we eradicate that process. Now, my last name is Boone, and uh, I and my family are related to the American explorer Daniel Boone. Daniel, we are descendants of his brother Samuel. And I've wanted to use him as kind of an analogy of what we're trying to do. You could look at the COVID-19 virus as the trigger finger as Daniel holds his rifle or musket. That trigger finger ignites a devastating shower of shells and ammunition. But I would view the comorbidities like hypertension, obesity, chronic lung disease, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. That would be like the ammunition or the shells or the bullets that are added to the rifle. So if we were to take those bullets, that ammunition out of the rifle, we then have a trigger finger that can't really do much damage. So that would be kind of an analogy that I might need, I might use tonight as we explore how do we protect ourselves from COVID-19. Now, looking at those comorbidities, rather than just an epidemiologic public health CDC approach, we need a personalized precision approach to your various issues in this regard. Now, the other thing I would encourage you to do is embrace whatever abnormalities you might have. Uh, weight, obesity, embrace optimization of that. Uh, I tend to look in the mirror and probably judge myself less harshly than I should. Every pound of wasted weight can be dangerous. So a good time during this pandemic and then to pr prepare us for the future is to optimize nutrition and exercise. Hypertension, embrace abnormalities. We work a lot with professional athletes and firefighters, and they don't like being told they're, uh, they're in trouble, especially in the blood pressure world. I have, can't tell you the number of times that I've heard uh, very fit, strong individuals that are first responders, firefighters, uh, professional athletes, and they think our blood pressure machines are broken, which they are never broken. Their blood pressure just is higher than it should be, and embrace that abnormality. Then you can treat it and be protected especially during these dangerous times. And the same would hold true with chronic lung disease, uh, diabetes, embrace blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C. And then in cardiovascular disease, embrace the testing that might have shown minor abnormalities instead of ignoring them or explaining them away. So in a sense, we're redefining significant disease and aggressive care long before hopefully you need a hospital or, or an emergency room, an ICU or a ventilator. So first of all, let's look at the presence of disease. Uh, how can you detect your presence? Probably the most important thing that I do is that even beyond smoking, the greatest risk of cardiovascular disease is just good old aging. So the older I become, the more I am at risk. Therefore, the more I need to work on reducing my internal age, my physiologic age. Now, I listed here a number of tests that many of you've had all the way up to the more serious bypass surgery stand, having had a stroke, all those put you at higher risk. And they tell us that your entire blood vessel system is in trouble. And then more basic uh, cardiovascular tests like coronary calcium scoring, carotid IMT, carotid plaque, embrace any testing that you might have had. And if you haven't had any of these tests, then assume you've got trouble. The older you are and the worse your family history, uh, uh, interpret these results aggressively, individually, in a personalized precision way so that you might dominate uh, this disease expression process that might be triggered by the trigger finger of COVID-19. Many of my strategies look at looking inside your blood vessel. Uh, this illustration tells us what we need to know. The arteries of the body generally don't cause much trouble until they're about 70% blocked. But most heart attacks occur in people that have 30 to 50% blockages that wouldn't show up as chest pain or abnormal, even angiograms. The plaque fractures, the endothelium becomes uh, vulnerable and it breaks, cracks, clots, and develops problem in arteries that would not previously been thought to be problematic and certainly not symptomatic. One thing that is important in the cardiovascular realm is that it lends itself to early imaging. 
as the plaque is developing from the left, left of this screen all the way to the right, you can't feel a thing. It's too bad that we don't get headaches or some feeling poorly as this plaque develops. If this were developing in our joints, we would feel it. But when it develops in the heart, you don't feel anything until oftentimes it's too late. There are many testing strategies that can accomplish this. As you look across the bottom of that graph showing atherosclerotic plaque development, which is another one of those bullets or ammunition in the rifle of Daniel Boone's gun, as you look across there, there are many ways to image that. On the left side of the screen would be ultrasound imaging that might pick up early fatty streaks, uh, early plaque that we define as carotid imaging. We've done that with all of our patients in many of the mass testing conventions that we've worked with with many of you in the past. Then as you move forward, CAT scans can de determine calcium in the artery wall. And then eventually off to the right, you'll see CT angiograms and other more advanced in imaging that can pick up softer plaque in the arteries. And many of you who have seen these, get out your old records and aggressively interpret these. If you have any calcium in your arteries, you have endothelial dysfunction, which then, especially during these dangerous times of COVID-19, need to be stabilized and considered talking with your doctor about things like statin drugs, aspirin, and other plaque controlling medications. So uh, embrace a calcium score. My calcium score in the coronary arteries is 17. The number I've seen range from one to 9,000. But a little bit of calcium in your coronary is like a little bit of cancer, meaning in the cancer world, we embrace that and we treat it aggressively. In the heart disease world, we say, wait until it gets bigger until you have chest pain and then we can do other things with it. So embrace that. So even though my calcium score is low, I take it seriously and then try to do interventions that would stabilize my endothelium. More advanced testing uh, would show us just more uh, uh, dominance of the plaque. And this kind of illustrates something called the Glagoff effect in this slide, courtesy of Stanford. It shows the black hole in that slide being the vessel um, lumen where the blood flows. But then you see the blood vessel has almost doubled itself inside to protect us from the plaque that's clogging the artery. So again, all of these tests can be helpful in determining the presence of atherosclerosis. Much more simply is a test that we've done on thousands of people around the world. This is a carotid assessment. The carotid artery are, the, are two arteries that come off shortly after the blood exits the heart and they move toward the, toward the brain. And then just below the jawline, uh, they bifurcate, they divide and go to the face and the brain. And that swirling current at that point, illustrated by this arrow, has the same hemodynamic and swirling forces that occur in the widowmaker of the heart. So when I see my carotid plaque in my neck, I'm almost positive I've got the same kinds of plaque in my heart, probably in my brain as well. So any carotid artery plaque, now in a typical hospital report, this plaque would be ruled as no significant disease. But in my report, I would look at this as heart attack, stroke, and endothelial damage waiting to happen. And it would define that I have vulnerability to something like influenza A and influenza B, but more recently and more powerfully and more dangerous COVID-19 illness. In addition to that, if you get a carotid scan in our hands, we will develop something called an intimal media thickness uh, measurement. So that little green X in the middle is one centimeter closer to the heart or proximal to the bifurcation. And again, this carotid artery, these two arteries are really the fifth and sixth coronary arteries. They're only an inch or two away from uh, the actual arteries of the heart. So they're very predictive of this process. And then the intimal media thickness can be measured. It should be less than 0 0.600 millimeters. So if you've had data like that before, we want optimal intimal media thickness. This is the pavement that highlights and lines the 60,000 miles of blood vessels that you have in your body. Just think about that. The blood vessels in your body, 60,000 miles, you could stack them end to end and wrap around the earth twice. And that's just one human being. And this lining is a measure of who you are. It gets thicker with age and bad habits and high cholesterol and smoking and stress. It gets better with optimal treatment that would improve the lining like statin drugs and ACEs and ARBs and, and uh, some micronutrients and even recently uh, some omega-3s. So that lining, you should look at that if you had these reports. But again, if you have none of these reports, assume based on your age and your genetics, your family history as to whether this might be here, uh, present and then aggressively pursue uh, things that might stabilize this situation. Here my staff is imaging a 57-year-old male stockbroker. 
And he has, again, a number of bullets, a number of, uh, of shells of ammunition into that rifle that might be pointed at us during this COVID-19 uh, vulnerability situation. He has coronary artery calcium by the CAT scan. He has carotid plaque bulges in the artery lining and the artery wall that signal endothelial dysfunction. And if infected by COVID-19, likely the same things that cause this plaque and will make it dangerous for heart attack and stroke will be triggered in the lung as well. The arterial age, his IMT, his carotid IMT, the thickness of this yellow brick road, being from Kansas, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz make me think of that. But the thickness of this pavement is 1.025 millimeters, should be less than 0.6. So something's going on there. We then convert that to what it should be for his age. He's got the arterial age, the thickness of a 90-year-old, which makes him vulnerable, and this fills ammunition for the COVID-19 trigger. So be aggressive in this regard and embrace the drugs that might be helpful in converting and improving this situation. Ultrasound echocardiography of the heart can also help us. The RVOT in the middle of this side is the right ventricle that recent studies have shown stretches as that part of the heart, which is pumping blood into the lungs, is pumping it into very diseased blood vessels in the lungs. Again, the cardiovascular connection. Ultimately, even as you look at your echocardiogram, you want to be sure your aortic valve is not sclerotic, your arch is less than four centimeters, the walls of the heart, the septum, uh, the left ventricular wall are less than 1.1 centimeters thick, the left atrium less than four centimeters. All of these would signal changes that occur with high blood pressure. Hypertension, one of the major comorbidities. So I have always treated high blood pressure more based not so much on the blood pressure, but on changes that occur in the heart. Is it becoming thickened and stiffened? We measure something called heart age, where we measure how stiff your heart is as it fills and empties. And this is a very early change. And the heart stiffness sometimes can occur with aging, but often it occurs more likely with peripheral sequela of blood pressure. So if you've had a report from us in the past and showing elevated heart age, increased septal size and, and left ventricular free wall size, E to A ratio abnormalities, all of those would just signal simple garden variety aggressive blood pressure care to help the heart muscle and the valves. So all of these would define the presence of disease. But as I said, don't worry if you haven't had all these tests, just assume aggressive care and assume that optimizing even minor risk will be protective of you during this time. The next step, we'll look at the causation of the disease. What loads the rifle? What puts the shell in the magazine that might be uh, problematic during COVID-19? So look at your medical and family history. If you had uncles and aunts that had heart attacks and strokes and stents and other things at a young age, and the older I get, anything under 70 is too young to have these problems, even under 80. So be aggressive in your interpretation of your life and then also optimize your lifestyle uh, habits and, and other issues in that regard. So let's look a little bit more at causation. What might cause this disease? And another very important issue is genetics. Now here's a report of a 54-year-old female real estate executive. And the top number is 9604. That's a test called 11-dehydrothromboxane B2. Now, of all the things that cause heart disease and stroke, the clot is the last evidence of that process. But we often don't have any measurements in our medical settings to determine how much aspirin do we, do, do we need or how much of a risk is the clot. Cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, we measure those. I love this test uh, because it gives me an idea of how clottable is your blood. Certainly, this is one of the cytokine storm oxidative comorbidities that are surging in the COVID-19 patient. So this patient already starts at a great disadvantage. This number of 9604 should be less than 1500. Now it's easily cured by taking aspirin 81 milligrams a day. That's something you should review with your doctor because aspirin has downsides with bleeding and, and peptic ulcer disease, but very, very protective possibly in this setting, especially with a number like 9604. So that would be a precision personalized approach a more public health report approach would be if you've had a heart attack or you've got plaque, that's another reason I like to prescribe and take myself an aspirin a day. The next one is another genetic factor that might upgrade your concern about your health. ApoE3E3 E3 is a genotype that is quite prevalent. And as you can see on this slide, it's present in 55% of the population. But any, anyone with a four genotype has a higher risk of dyslipidemias, cholesterol abnormalities, atherosclerosis, and even dementia. 
and a 4-4 and a 2-4 are both present in only about 1% of the population. But if you've had these tests before, if you've got a 4 in either one of these gene types, be especially aggressive in your cardiovascular preventative care. Now below that is the assessment of factor V laden and prothrombin mutation. Those are two very, not very dangerous clotting risks that are inherited genetically. They're not like hemophilia or uh, lupus anticoagulant or things like that, but they might be lurking in the population as a carrier for someone who's hypercoagulable. I wonder if the people dying younger or some of the people getting into trouble have these underlying abnormalities, which if known about just require more aggressive care for clot control and plaque control. So look at your charts for those abnormalities. And again, all those do is upgrade my aggressiveness of care. The next genotype is MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency. And in this patient, this 54-year-old real estate executive, she has a deficiency in that gene, which then processes B vitamins and folate. She has an inability to metabolize or methylate folate appropriately. And there's a buildup of homocysteine, which you see at the bottom of the slide is showing as 11. Uh, that is cured by better B vitamins and methylated folates and folic acid. But knowing about that, this is an inflammatory marker that might cause problems. Right below that is hyperinsulinemia. Even fasting, your insulin level ought to be below 12. Hers is 23. She's not yet diabetic because her hemoglobin A1c is 5.0, but, and her, even her fasting blood sugar is even low normal at 67, but she is requiring extra insulin. She's insulin resistant, metabolic syndrome, another risk putting a small bit of bullet in our rifle that might be triggered by COVID-19. Below that, vitamin D is 31. That is fairly good, but I like it more like 50 to 80. Now, a recent study showed higher uh, hospital morbidities and mortalities uh, with COVID-19 in people with low vitamin D. Now, the data is not a, a, enough for them to say, take vitamin D and you'll be protected, but it sounds good to me to make sure your vitamin D levels are 50 to 80 and I'll take my chances. Again, not a panacea, not a cure-all, not a overall public health recommendation for the world, but a precision priced person, uh, placed personalized recommendation for you to look at vitamin D intake. Below that, uric acid, an inflammatory process that causes gout, like that to be normalized, and homocysteine we've talked about. So all of these become various causative factors in the disease, genetically and metabolically. COVID-19 itself is stimulating stress, mental stress, another trigger, a causative trigger in this process. Uh, the mental stress can trigger from an article we wrote and published in 2003, it can trigger hemodynamic shearing stress on those tender linings of the artery where plaque may exist. Mental stress will thicken and stiffen the heart, cause palpitations, tachycardia, change cholesterol levels, promote clotting, damage heart muscle fibers, promote plaque growth, raise blood pressure, all of those things problematic in this area. So the more stress control, nutrition control you have, and then the protective medication and other strategies to protect the lining of your artery will be improved and accelerated as we deal with the stress response. Even the oral and dental health, as you all know, very important to optimize periodontal health and general oral health as far as maintaining your mouth and your teeth in optimal orders. This can be just as important as any of these other factors I've looked at. And often poor oral health will accelerate some of these risks and ultimately vulnerabilities. Many of the vulnerabilities we'll talk about now next. We've added bullets to the gun, or we've made the ammunition, we've added it to the gun. Now adding gun power is vulnerability and certainly periodontal disease and poor dental health will make you more vulnerable, I would think, to uh, ravages like the COVID-19 disease. We're now going to talk about blood and uh, physiologic biomarkers. This lists a number of biomarkers that we often measure. All of them are related to uh, cardiovascular health and cardiovascular vulnerability. More specifically, quite interesting, are numbers that are associated with plaque development. Beyond imaging the anatomic plaque river, uh, growth, as you can see from left to the right of this side, we also have companion blood biomarkers that travel with this. These going from F2 isoprostine and oxidized LDL through more advanced uh, testing. On the right, cardiac troponin T and cardiac troponin I are highly sensitive measures that we do in our clinic, even before and after treadmill testing. They are evidences of microscopic heart muscle fiber damage. 
Now, very interestingly, about a month ago, publications came out that cardiac troponin T at high levels was associated with a 10 times higher cardiovascular or death rate during uh, COVID-19. Now, what this means, two things. Probably those that had microscopic evidence of car cardiac troponin T in an outpatient setting totally asymptomatically, when they're in the ravages of the COVID-19 virus beyond the respiratory system into the blood vessels and eventually the heart, those numbers reach the highest levels. So they might have been caused by the COVID-19 virus and the cytokine storm and the clotting storm that cou couples with that. But they might have also been present in people at m more asymptomatic levels before they were hospitalized. So look at the cardiac troponin I and the cardiac troponin T very sensitively. In your reports, cardiac troponin I should be less than 3.0. Cardiac troponin T, both highly sensitive numbers, should be less than six. And if they're not, then all the medications we'll talk about in the next section will bring those into that arena. One section back is myeloperoxidized MPO and LPPLA2. These are very sophisticated numbers that measure the thickness of the roof, the, the rocky shell on top of this volcano. I kind of like with our friends from Hawaii to talk about the issues related to atherosclerosis, much like a lava flow building up inside the lining walls of the artery. The Lava flow is not that different from lava in Hawaii under the ground as it's ready to percolate forward through, uh, through a break in the roof of the, of the volcano. The robustness of that roof can protect and the control of the lava can protect as well. So in the assessment of vulnerability, we see uh, in the middle of this slide toward the bottom, myeloperoxidase. Now myeloperoxidase measures how thick is the roof on the volcano. It should be less than 300. This is a 51-year-old construction manager and developer. 464 would mean the roof on top of his plaque, very dangerous, thin. In medical terms, this is a thin fibrous cap on top of the molten lava of your liquefied cholesterol under the surface of the artery. In addition to that, his LPPLA2, which is another one of those yellow numbers in the middle of the slide toward the bottom, is 218. That number above 150 and myeloperoxidase above 300 are a deadly combination ready for the uh, volcano to explode. So immediately, even two weeks ago when we saw this patient, we instituted statin therapy and then PCSK9 therapy, both of which cool off the volcano and thicken the roof over the plaque uh, very effectively. Below that, you see 9.9 .9 is the HSCRP. That number ought to be below one. So this clearly is a place of multiple inter, infl inflammations that bring about vulnerability. Now, as you can see in this portion of the slide, looking at disease initiation and plaque growth under ADMA and microalbumin is HSCRP. This is the, probably the most accessible number that all of you have access to in your usual medical care. It's a very inexpensive number. Ask your doctor to get it or look at your records. If that number is above one, then you likely have the beginnings of some of these atherosclerotic diseases that might make you more susceptible to COVID-19. You can also get the more sophisticated numbers we've talked about, myeloperoxidase of 464, LPPLA2. I've seen those improve in even one month as we stabilize these molten lava-filled volcanoes that might cause us trouble. Uh, fibrinogen at 537 is in a blood test that's elevated when the body is trying to rid itself of clot. So the body is trying to get rid of that clot that you see off to the right uh, as, as the plaque matures and ruptures and causes uh, micro uh, clots and other issues. So this entire profile, very dangerous, but all preventively. None of these patients I'm telling you about had felt anything. So if we can prepare their body by turning all these from red to green, then I believe their chances of surviving influenza, but more importantly, COVID-19, and then whatever future pandemics will come will be better. Up at the top of this slide is just good old garden variety cholesterol. Total cholesterol, I like at least below 150. Below that is LDL direct. That should be below 70 in anybody with plaque, including me. Triglycerides, I like well below 100, even down to 50. All of these particles, except for the green HDL of 64, 
All of these particles are proven more and more every week in the world's literature to be toxic. So the cholesterol that floats through your bloodstream is toxic. The LDL cholesterol is toxic. It needs to be cleared out into the brain and the, and the liver where all the action occurs. And then throughout the rest of this process, we see other uh, particles and other issues that are important. Now, toward the middle of the slide, you see LP little a. That's an especially important genetic type of cholesterol. LP little a mass is an emerging risk. It is an especially um, clottable, uh, thrombogenic, atherogenic cholesterol type. So sometimes people can have very normal cholesterols, but their lipoprotein A is elevated. So ask your doctors to measure that test. And if this, in this case, the mass should be less than 30, his was 87. And there's a new test looking at activity. It should be below 75 LPPLA2 activity. Uh, so all of these advanced biomarkers can help us decide where the volcanoes are, if they're there, how do we, how do we snuff out the hot lava that might burst through the issues and optimizing all these biomarkers, very important. Let me introduce you to Bruce McCandless. If you saw the recent Neil Armstrong movies, he's on the ground talking to Neil Armstrong as they're landing on the moon. And then later on, Bruce became the first astronaut to fly untethered on a spacewalk. Very interesting gentleman. And he began working with me, understanding the effect of stress on the heart, because obviously a little more than my stress is doing what he's doing right here. But he said this was a piece of cake to flying and landing a jet on a aircraft carrier in the South China Sea during the Vietnam War. But Dr. Or Dr. McCandless uh, illustrated a point. You see the red dot in the middle? That's one of our uh, Hugo metrics design that looks at the blood pressure. The, dot, the red dot is normal, but you can see the green surging line is blood pressure during stress. And I use this to illustrate that you want to embrace so that you might treat those more severe blood pressures. My blood pressure is perfect when I'm doing nothing. When I'm a little stressed, it might get to be 130 over 80, but I've read, measured myself during a lecture, and it might be 180 over 110. I need to embrace the worst of those pressures to take a medicine that would stabilize and relax my blood vessels. This further to you, the left, these arrows go, the more constriction the blood vessel is. So you can imagine if I've got a COVID-19 generated cytokine clot, in my vessels and then my vessels are constricting because of stress, I wanna open them up. And that's where medicines like ACEs and ARBs do this. And here's uh, Dr. McCandless after uh, treatment. And so he highlighted this as we worked with some astronauts. So our final section of this discussion is around eradicating the disease, eliminating what's in the barrel of the gun, attacking these risks very aggressively. Statins, very important. Statins have gotten a bad rap. If you think statins are bad for you, Basically, it's not true. The medical data throughout the world is probably the most life-saving drug in the history of the world, but five to 10% of people will have muscle aches and pains. They can't take a statin, but statin's very appropriate. Now, atorvastatin and the various statins, as I use them aggressively throughout my career, and here it shows the 57-year-old stockbroker after seven years of therapy, you can see all the red numbers are now blue artery ages, or excuse me, green. Artery age has gone from 90 to 45. Everything has improved aggressively in this regard. Statins are a part of that process. Uh, back when I was first involved taking care of some of the first AIDS patients in Portland, Oregon, Dr. Fauci was just becoming famous at that point. Uh, but in the treatment of even AIDS, it was found that those on a statin had better survival. Hepatitis, another virus, those on a statin, better survival. Influenza, when you look at the epidemiology of this process, even influenza patients survive better on a statin. And I've heard even in the intensive care units, they're putting people on statins even as they're admitted with more severe COVID-19. So embrace the aggressive use of statins. Statins are one of the reasons that we used to do a million bypass surgeries a year in America. Now we're down less than 100,000. Not so good for my friends who are the bypass surgeons, but showing us that we're optimizing vascular health and preventing this process. And then if you wanna move even further to clean out your gun, we're taking all the ammunition out of the gun but this would be what my son-in-law, who's a captain in the military at Fort Bragg, as he cleans his weapons, he really probably has to clean them out a lot better than Daniel Boone did. And the new way to do that is PCSK9 inhibition, which I think probably is going to help protect uh, from COVID-19, although this is a very cutting edge, high-end therapy. Now, what it does is it, it, it protects the cholesterol receptors. You see on the left of the side, that little ball-like sub, substance is a, a molecule, a, a, 
an apoB containing particle in the bloodstream that carries cholesterol inside of it. That is then the pink area below is a liver cell. The receptors that were discovered by Brown and Goldstein, who won the Nobel Prize, grab one of these and they deposit them in the liver and then they recycle to then once again catch another ball. They recycle 120 times over 15 hours and then they disintegrate. There are billions of them, but what kills them and what hurts them is PCSK9, the little aqua gene that comes out of the liver to attach to a receptor and destroy it. But there are two new drugs, evolocumab repatha, alirocumab prolamin, that are every two weeks a monoclonal antibody injection, the little red things you see on the left of the screen, they attach to PCSK9 and prevent destruction of the receptors. So once a PCSK9 dose has occurred, the receptors are very robust, they're totally protected, and cholesterol will drop another 50 to 70 percent uh, within two to four weeks of taking your first injection. Very exciting, new, cutting edge, very cutting edge way to clean out your arteries. Here's an example of, of me back in 2015 and 16 as we look at Obviously, I'm taking rosuvastatin to protect my arteries, but back in those days, my LDL cholesterol in 2016 was 109. My artery age had begun to get worse. It had gone as low as in the 50s, but now it had gone back up to 70. My IMT 0.843 millimeters. Uh, so at that point, discovering this new drug, I took two doses of the drug, and look what happened. My cholesterol went from 109 down to 30. My artery age dropped 14 years. My IMT dropped towards 0 0.720. Now it's 0.694 after now four years of PCSK9 therapy added on to rosuvastatin. Now, most importantly, look at that top number, LPPLA2. That's a measure of the hot lava inside my artery walls, the little volcanoes building in that artery wall. You can see 174 down to 79. Almost after two doses, I had reduced the inflammation oxidation. Now, I can't prove it, and there certainly will be no study that proves it, but I'll bet that that makes me even more hardy in resisted COVID-19 as we debulk the volcano and secure the roof of the plaque in a very optimal way. Here's a 69-year-old physician uh, who was in the military, a West Point graduate himself, same sort of situation. His IMT, 0.841, he'd already had a heart attack, a couple of hundred percent blockages, LDL 92, after a PCSK9 inhibitor, only two doses. Cholesterol went from 92 down to eight, artery age dropped from 70 to 49, IMT went the same direction as well. So this is just one more very executive cutting edge approach that I think in 10 years, the entire world will be using. They're coming out with an injection that lasts every six months, and then another oral version that blocks the PCSK9 at its proteoglycan docking point on the receptor. So protecting cholesterol receptors. Now, some would say, oh, my cholesterol is too low. But actually, all this is doing is not lowering your cholesterol. It's getting it out of your bloodstream and putting it into the factories that are your liver and your brain to do what cholesterol is supposed to do. Cholesterol in your bloodstream is like gasoline in the street. It just catches fire. The gasoline must get into the cars and trucks to do its work. Cholesterol must, must get into the liver cells to do its work. So that would be what we're seeing with the PCSK9 inhibitor. And then the final drug-related summary is the ACE inhibitor and the angiotensin receptor blocker. The virus enters the lung through something called an ACE2 docking site. That's also the target of medicines that end in pril, captopril, lisinopril, ram, ramipril, and so on, and also is involved with the ARBs, losartan, valsartan, omosartan. So initially, there was a little bit of concern that maybe these drugs are going to make the, it easier for the virus to get in, but subsequently, it's been found that those drugs should be continued. ACEs and ARBs, even in a recent lecture by Robert Eckel, former president of American Heart Association, begins to show that you see on the right that the death rate of those on ACEs and ARBs is about a third of those not on ACEs and ARBs. Now, this is not enough to say that COVID-19 is going to be prevented by ACEs and ARBs, but I like my chances being on losartan because losartan blocks it even later on or the angiotensin receptor blockers. Most importantly, however, is aggressive treatment of blood pressure and cardiovascular issues. So remember, we've detected the presence of disease, the ammunition in the gun, loading the rifle with the causation issues, determining vulnerability with various uh, uh, biomarkers, and then finally eradicating the disease. Uh, I would encourage you to aggressively look at your past medical records and embrace these very simple technologies. So to summarize, I take 
rosuvastatin, 40 milligrams. Every two weeks, evolocumab or patha. Every day, 25 of losartan and a baby aspirin. And I think that has mitigated many of my risks in these areas of an anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry. So again, a great pleasure. Hopefully I've given you some information and created an air of optimism as you have embraced preventive cardiology strategies. And I'll look forward to questions that we might have at this time. So Jeff, thank you for uh, so much information. I can't believe every time I listen to you how much I learn. And uh, I'm sure that many in the audience tonight feel the same way in terms of uh, things like Repatha, which um, after this uh, lecture tonight, I'll be taking mine uh, because uh, I'm coming up on two weeks. At any rate, uh, let's take a look at some of the questions and uh, have you answer them. Can you comment on the concern of taking ACE inhibitors during this pandemic? Yes, I uh, hurried over that last slide, but ultimately the initial concern was the virus enters the lung through the ACE2 site in the lung. Now, the angiotensin receptor blockers and the ACE inhibitors work in the lung to prevent that cascade of chemicals from causing high blood pressure. So there was a little bit of publication with some hypothetical thoughts that those drugs might be problematic. But in the last few weeks, they have shown not only are these drugs neutral, but probably beneficial. So I would continue to take your ACEs. I'm even more fond of the ARB, the angiotensin receptor blocker, which blocks the angiotensin converting enzyme cascade one step further. So keep taking your ACEs and ARBs. And I would think probably you're benefiting beyond just neutrality, but actually protecting uh, your artery walls. Okay. So any comment on resveratrol and cardiac health? Yes, I think supplements are actually quite uh, helpful. Um, I never bet my life totally on non-drug uh, issues, but certainly resveratrol is in the, the realm of, of non-drug therapies that may be beneficial. So I would embrace those and be aggressive with those, along with other supplements from omega-3s to, to zinc. All of those are probably helpful. But if you've got concerns about disease, I would move forward to a more, uh, a more robust medical regimen. Uh, what is the relationship of uh, statins uh, to blood sugar and the possibility of increasing the risk for diabetes? Very interesting. That data has surfaced, and over the last decade, there has been some evidence of, of concern over blood sugar elevating from statins. In my mind, the data was statistically significant, but the hemoglobin A1C went from from 5.7 to 5.8. It was statistically significant, and there is probably a bit of blood sugar issue. If you're concerned about that, there's a statin called pitavastatin, livolozepatamag are the brand names, and it has great data. It doesn't affect, uh, it doesn't affect coenzyme Q10 and has very little, in fact, no uh, effect on blood sugar. But I tell from my, from my family on down, just drop a couple pounds so you can take the wonderful statin so your A1C drops a, a touch. So again, my A1C when I was overweight and out of shape was 6.1 on Crestor uh, Rosuvastatin 40. It's now 5.5 after losing 20 pounds. So I would embrace the benefit of the statin as opposed to fear any slight blood sugar elevation, although still work with your doctor and check your individual numbers. Is PCSK9 oral? on the market yet? Not yet. In fact, I heard a, a lecture by uh, um, uh, a, another, uh, a Dutch uh, cardiologist the other day who's on the, the planning team. It's, it's almost top secret at this point. The oral medicine is though in beginnings of human studies. And it appears the PCSK9 docks to the receptor through something called a proteoglycan. And they're figuring out you can take an oral medicine that may block that. And then inclycerin is a new drug that will be on the market within probably a few months. And it's a PCSK9 inhibitor that gets the PCSK9 in the liver before it gets into the bloodstream. Has no, it looks like side effects, no impact on the liver. But you'll eventually take that once every six months. And then as far as vaccines are concerned, I'll bet you in 20 years, your kids are getting a, a cholesterol PCSK9 vaccine down the road. So what is the thinking today related to taking niacin and taking vasipa? Yes, now, it's very interesting. Now, niacin, I don't use very much anymore because uh, rosuvastatin and even 
uh, Rapatha Ray's HDL. Now I have seen Dr. Eckel and his crew at the University of Colorado who are these advanced uh, lipidologists looking at genetic abnormalities and for some familial hypercholesterolemias, especially with high lipoprotein A, they are still adding niacin to the mix. But I don't take niacin, I used to, I think it's been replaced by these other drugs. Now Vesipa, amazing results, it's called Icosapent ethyl. Everybody kind of thought all fish oil was the same and I still think in the less ill patient, it doesn't require pure icosapent ethyl, but they tested it out and found over a 30% reduction in heart attack and stroke when added to a statin. So amazing results. So the trouble is very expensive and you gotta have a triglyceride at least above 150, maybe above 135 to qualify. So if insurance covers it, I would definitely take it four pills a day. If not, then uh, fairly purified over-the-counter versions would be fine. Would CoQ10 help to take care of muscle pain and heart health for people on statins? Yes, I think all the vitamins that we use and prescribe have CoQ10 in it, and there, there is interesting possibilities. Now, over the years, I've had probably at least 30 people that have really severe uh, muscle aches and pains from statin, and I would say 25 out of those 30 have responded to the CoQ10 uh, benefits that occur with, uh, with pitavastatin. So think about pitavastatin, which is sold as Livolo and Zepatamag as an alternative. And then they still haven't proven that CoQ10 helps, but it's a little bit like what I've been talking about to, to this evening. Every one of these little strategies may not totally prevent COVID-19 death, but each one is like a different player in a football game. So if I got my left tackle is aspirin, my right tackle is Vesipa, you know, I've got a, a full team, none of which are gonna 100% win the game. So I think in, in this case, the statin is a part of that. You need to take it if you can, try to get uh, uh, pitavastatin as an alternative. And then there are some recent articles that I can send to you that talk about all the ways that people can attenuate the muscle aches and pains, but they are very real. Now, when I stop a statin, I'm still old and have sore joints and when I take it. So I've got enough to act like I've got statin side effects, but it's more me and not the drug. So, about 10% of you, though, need to look for something else, and CoQ10 is a reasonable effort. Livolo, pitavastatin doesn't lower Co CoQ10, so that might be an option as well. So we'll do just a couple more questions. Uh, what is your opinion of taking metformin to reduce inflammation and chronic neuropathic pain? Metformin, fabulous drug, uh, often being used now in anti-aging clinics almost for everybody. So I would embrace that uh, uh, 500 to 1,000 twice a day, uh, probably the lower the hemoglobin A1C and the better uh, inflammation control from that is a good one. So it's not part of my usual regimen. And again, I don't take it myself, but I kind of want to. So be aggressive. And if you have any blood sugar abnormalities and can tolerate it well, do it. Okay. So there's a, a lot of talk about lowering LDL and with Repatha and drugs like that, obviously, uh, that's the result that we're looking for. But what is the significance of HDL these days? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, it's very interesting. I've got a number of patients whose total cholesterol might be 100, their HDL is 70, and their LDL is 10, which is totally reversing the old ratios from the past. So I think I still like HDL. Repatha does not lower HDL at all. It raises it. So all of the high-density lipoproteins are the ones that are good. Uh, they have tried a number of drug therapies to raise HDL and none of them have panned out like the other end of lowering LDL. So I think the best way to attack your ratio is lowering LDL, but I still believe strongly in HDL, just not enough to give people a drug to take it uh, because those haven't panned out yet. Last question. Um, what is your thinking on plant-based diets? Uh, fantastic. I wish I could uh, push that more in terms of my patient populations. Uh, but plant-based diet are fantastic. I think, you know, everything from Weight Watchers to the Mediterranean diet all have some, some good things to, to, to develop around those issues. And I have seen uh, some naturopaths that have almost optimized every of these biochemical abnormalities that I mentioned today with just plant-based diet. Even that 11-dehydrothromboxane, which I said requires aspirin. I've had patients that have been normalized in that area when they can't take uh, vitamins by or uh, can't take aspirin by a plant-based diet. So I would be very high on that and certainly agree with some of your previous speakers that uh, that's the, the, the best way to go.